Yes, every, every December, it's the great Christmas cookie conspiracy. And we come before you and tell you how desperately we need cookies for our guests, for the Christmas production. And the truth is that I then freeze them and eat them all year long. So we, uh, I don't think we need more cookies. I think you guys did great on that. So we appreciate that. I can only imagine that the disciples were flying as high as a kite because Jesus had reached the pinnacle of his success, his popularity. And furthermore, the disciples were heading to this massive celebration, this festival, and crowds of people were intrigued with the disciples' leader, with the disciples' friend, People were believing in Jesus. They were following him. They were looking for him. In fact, great crowds lined the streets just to see Jesus and greet him. And they were even ready to crown him as the king. Both my brother Jimmy and my son Connor were able to go up to Cleveland for the massive parade that took place several years ago. The Cleveland Cavaliers had won a championship, the first championship in Cleveland since 1964, and the whole city was celebrating the Cleveland Cavaliers championship. And both my brother and my son told me that they had never seen anything like it. Both of them said it was a little bit scary because the crowd was so big. I wonder if that's what it was like for Jesus and the disciples as they entered Jerusalem that day. The more that I study this passage of scripture, the more that I believe it was very similar. But instead of LeBron James being in that vehicle going down the middle of the road, it was Jesus and his disciples. And part of the reason why Jesus was so popular makes a lot of sense. He would actually be very popular today for this very reason. The word was spreading. He had raised a guy from the dead. And not just any guy, a guy who had been dead for four days. And I don't mean to be gross this morning, but the guy's body was starting to rot. It began to stink. And here's what people do when they don't have a TV, when they don't have a cell phone, when they don't have the internet, when they don't have a laptop, when they don't have an iPad. They talk. People gossip. People tell stories. They spread news verbally. And the news was being spread all over the city and even into the countryside and other cities everywhere that this man named Jesus had raised a dead man to life. And just like today, if we heard that about somebody, from somebody that we trusted, we would want to see that person. So everyone wanted to see him. And they they wanted to believe in him. They wanted to have hope in him and to follow him. And Jesus was at the very height of his popularity. And the author John tells us about this event. He says, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, look how the whole world has gone after him. There were some people who had come to this great festival and they too wanted to see Jesus. They went directly to one of the disciples named Philip and they said, hey, we want to see Jesus. Philip said, "Uh, let me me take you to Andrew. And so he, he took these guys to Andrew and he said, Andrew, they want to see Jesus. And Philip and Andrew together went to tell Jesus, hey, there's some guys here that want to see you. I think there was probably a lot of energy, a lot of excitement that this very popular Jesus was was being sought by everybody. And and Philip and Andrew were a part of this. They were his friends. And and they, they said, hey, 
Jesus, there's some guys here that want to see you. And then Jesus dropped this bombshell on Philip and Andrew. You know what he said to them? He said, Philip, Andrew, I am stressed out. I am depressed. I'm I'm having an anxiety attack. Well, Jesus didn't say those things because those words weren't around back then. But Jesus used the strongest language possible to describe his condition. He said, my soul is troubled, which was an expression of anguish, severe anxiety, fear, dread. And we, of course, now know why Jesus, at the height of his popularity, was so stressed out. It was because of his death. It was because of the dreaded cross that was right around the corner from what was taking place. And finally, the disciples began to understand a little bit that their leader, the one for whom they had surrendered everything, was going to die. It didn't matter that he had raised others from the dead. He was going to die. He would be leaving them. He would be gone forever. And I don't know if there's anything in our lives to which we can compare this event But I was trying to think of something I thought maybe the closest illustration would be our spouse. So, for more than 30 years, I've loved my wife, and every year I love her more. So if she came to me and she said, Mark, I'm leaving. You've been hunting too much, you don't make me a priority, and I'm sick of it. I'm out the door, I'm never coming back. I think it would be very accurate to say that my life would be in absolute turmoil. I'd be broken. I'd be a troubled man. And maybe that's just a potential illustration to describe what the disciples were feeling. It is certainly an understatement, but suffice it to say that their hearts were troubled. And according to the author John, something very interesting happened. The anxious, stressed out, tense Christ became the comforter and the encourager. And maybe you've seen that before at a funeral viewing. I've gone up to the grieving person to offer words of comfort about the the lost loved one. And instead, I, I couldn't say a word or I began to cry And instead of me bringing comfort and encouragement to that person that was grieving, suddenly they began to encourage and comfort me. That's what happened to Jesus. He told the disciples, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. And instead of them comforting and helping him, he began to comfort and help them. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. I'm preparing an eternity for you. And then he provided a solution for their lives that had suddenly been turned and flipped upside down. In the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their turmoil, Jesus said this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. In Isaiah chapter 9, the child, the promised Messiah, baby Jesus, was called the Prince of Peace. And in today's scripture, we see the child as a grown man. And the man is promising peace to his dearest friends, to his dearest followers. He's promising stability and tranquility in the midst of their dissonance. He's promising peace. He's promising shalom, the Hebrew word, when things are right and when things are whole and restored. And this same peace that Jesus promised to his disciples, whose lives were in tremendous turmoil, he promises to us as his disciples today. And our message series for Advent is simply called Peace. And I'm not, I'm not certain that we realize the implications of Jesus giving us this peace. So 
So I want to look at some more of the context around the scripture where Jesus promised to give his followers peace. He says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's the verse we read earlier. The verse before it talked about a gift, the Holy Spirit. And in this short two-verse passage that I just read to you from the book of John, there are at least five truths about the peace that Jesus gives us. And this is not five points for the sermon. It's just five things that I think are very interesting about the peace that Jesus gives to us. Here's the first one. The peace that Jesus gives comes in the form of an advocate or a helper, somebody that goes for us. The peace that Jesus gives is the Holy Spirit. Those two are very connected in these two verses. The peace given in Jesus' name is from the Father. The peace Jesus gives is found in his teachings and his sayings. And finally, the peace that Jesus gives is not like any peace found in the world. Those are five truths from that little passage of Scripture. But again, I'm not certain that we realize the implications of that. I'm not sure we understand what it really means that that Jesus gave us the gift of peace. So I want to talk about those implications today. What's implied by the fact that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gives us peace? Here's the first implication. Gifts must be accepted. We accept Jesus as our Savior. We must also accept the gift of his Holy Spirit. We must also accept that gift of peace. I've shared with you in the past that most of the time for Christmas, I ask for money. The kids and Jill call me a Grinch because they say, what do you want? Give us your Christmas list. And I say, I just want money. This year, I actually gave them some things that I wanted. I had a list ready. One of the things was a foot massager. I know that sounds weird, but it's this... It's this electric thing, kind of like what they have at the mall, except just for your calves and your feet. And I know what this thing does and how, how good it makes your feet feel because my son Connor had one. But he took it to college with him. And I know that Jill got this for me. I already know that. And I wasn't snooping around or anything like that. In fact, I came home the other day and there was a box on the front porch. <clears throat> I actually took a picture of it. Foot calf massager. I thought to myself, I wonder what this is. I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack. But and not only did it say it there, but it said it on the top, you can see it twice, and on every side. So I knew that Jill had got me that request. And Jill, of course, was frustrated that I knew that she got one of the things on my list. Well, later that week, this past week, my feet were killing me. And I said, you know, hey, I know you got me that. I know it's up there. Uh, Can I go ahead and just open it and use it? And in her kind and gentle, loving spirit, she said, no way. (laughs) You're waiting till Christmas. But in my mind, I knew what was in that box. But I couldn't open it. I I couldn't use it to bring comfort and relief And so it meant nothing to me, and it will mean nothing to me until December 25th. Or maybe if she's really nice, she'll let me open it on Christmas Eve, December 24th. Wink, wink. (laughs) It seems so simple. And yet we complicate it many times. Have we accepted the wonderful gift of God's Holy Spirit? Have we, have we opened up that package and asked the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and accepted that peace? Gifts have to be accepted. They have to be open. They have to be used. The gift of peace through the Holy Spirit has to be activated in our lives. 
And sometimes we'll say, oh yeah, I did that 15 years ago. I, I remember asking the Holy Spirit to come into my life during a church service or during camp or during a retreat or a mission trip. I want to tell you that I find myself weekly, if not daily, asking God for more of his Holy Spirit. I cannot do it on my own. I cannot be kind to others on my own. I cannot put others before myself on my own. I can't keep the word of God a priority and prayer a priority without the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the first implication. Gifts must be accepted. Here's the second implication. Gifts from God are meant to be shared with others. One of the reasons why I often read through the entire Bible is because I like to see the big picture. That's my personality. I like to see how it fits together and the grand scheme of things. And there's this biblical reality that's found throughout the Bible, this underlying theme that when God gives us gifts, they are meant to be shared. Whether it's a spiritual gift, such as the gift of encouragement or the gift of discernment, whether it's a gift like uh, woodworking or uh, writing or singing, whether it's the gift of salvation, the gift of God's Son, the gift of the Holy Spirit, those gifts are intended to be shared with others. That's a theme throughout the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, everything in between. When we're blessed, it's our responsibility to bless others. One of the most confusing things in the Bible are the many times when it it seems as if the Jewish people are God's favorites. Or Esau and Jacob, the two brothers, and Jacob was God's favorite. Why is that? How is it that God picks favorites, or so it seems? When God picked Abraham and blessed Abraham and blessed the Israelite people, in Genesis chapter 12, he gave them these gifts, he gave them these blessings. Why did he choose Abraham? Why did he choose the nation of Israel? So that all nations would be blessed through him. So if God has blessed us, we are to bless others. If he's blessed us financially, we are to bless others. We are to bless the church. If God has gifted us with certain talents and abilities, we're to share those talents and abilities with others. It's no different with the God-given gift of peace. We have peace. A few weeks ago, how many of you were able to, to join us for the Thanksgiving feast? Let me see your hands. That was a great time together. And it was just, it, it looked good out there. People were fellowshipping. People were having fun. They were eating. It's always fun to eat. And I had several different people say, man, that was just great. It was a spirit of unity. It was a spirit of peace. And it was a, to me, it was a beautiful picture of the body of Christ. We had had a service together where we celebrated what Christ had done. We, we broke bread together. We shared communion symbolically in here. And then we went out and we had a dinner together. All is well within these four walls. And it was peaceful. But everything wasn't so peaceful for everyone else. Especially one man who was having suicidal thoughts. I don't know his name. I don't know his age. I just know that Monday morning, I turned the corner out here on Glen Acre and I was shocked to see police cars and, and yellow caution tape. And I had to turn around and go a different way to get into the church. When I got over here into the church parking lot, I saw a division of fire vans and vehicles. And within moments, Channel 6 News was actually set up and filming in our parking lot. And although what happened was not covered in the news or online anywhere... It was confirmed later by a police officer that right on the street next to our church, right on Glen Acre, a man had set himself on fire and committed suicide. So the black pile of ashes that I saw out there were probably his burnt clothing or hopefully not, but his burnt flesh. On our street, in our peaceful little town next to our peaceful little church, and it was a stark reminder to me That even though we may be experiencing the gift of peace in our lives and in our church, 
Not everyone knows or experiences the same peace. The gift of peace that's been given to us is meant to be shared with others. We never know what person is thinking thoughts of suicide. We don't ever know sometimes who is hopeless. And we have peace that's meant to be shared with others. We are blessed with peace. We are blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can share with others. Implication number one is that the gift of peace must be accepted. Implication number two, the gift of peace is meant to be shared with others. And here's the third and final implication, that the gift of peace is different than any peace the world can offer. And this third implication might apply to us very personally today. We might need to hear this. Or we, we might, be, might be considering someone else that we know. The peace that Jesus gives is enough. It is sufficient. The peace that the world gives is never enough. We always search for more if we get our peace from the world. The peace that Jesus gives is eternal. It's not just for now, it's for later. The peace that the world gives is temporary at best. I sang a little song a couple weeks ago that uh, we used to sing when we were teenagers. I have a peace in my heart that the world never gave me, and a peace it cannot take away, an everlasting peace that I know will be here to stay. A peace that is there even when we're discouraged, a peace that is there even when we have a loss, a peace that is there when we're troubled. There's an empty space in each one of us that can only be filled with the peace of Christ. So we can search for anything and everything that the world has to offer, whether it be power, whether it be money, whether it be relationships. But until we're filled with the peace that only Christ gives, we will be sadly disappointed and unfulfilled. So are we searching for peace in this world when we need to be seeking and embracing more of Jesus, the Prince of Peace? And if our answer to that question today is no, I'm not seeking more peace in the world. I I know the peace of Christ. Perhaps our question then should become, who do we know who is seeking peace in this world and does not know the peace of Christ? And how can we ignore that person? I said earlier that I'm not certain that we realize the implications of the gift of peace through the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave to us. So that's what we've discussed today. That the gift of peace has to be accepted. That's the first implication. That the gift of peace is meant to be shared with others. And finally, the gift of peace is different than any peace the world can offer. So let's bow together today and maybe you want to just pray about one of those implications. Maybe you've never accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of peace that Christ gives. Or maybe you've recognized today, I'm not sharing that with anybody. I've been given this tremendous gift, but I'm so wrapped up in everything that I'm doing myself. I'm not sharing it with other people. I know that I feel that way many times. I'm so busy doing things, good things many times, that I'm not sharing peace with anybody, the peace that I know. Or maybe it's that third one. Maybe just today you're saying, I... I'm kind of looking for things in the world to provide fulfillment and peace in my life, and I need to stop doing that. Or, or maybe I, I see that in a, a, a friend or family member. However you want to, to pray today, in regards to the implications of the gift of peace through the Holy Spirit, 
Just take a couple moments before we dismiss. Just talk to God. In this season, there are very few moments of quietness. But this is one of them today. So take a moment and talk to God.